guys. The list goes on and we were there for 48 hours. The cars, the passion. And they spent, I, I just couldn't believe it. They spent one billion dollars developing that car. It was called the F1 and they went for it. The BMW 7 Series was a great car and was probably the better than the Merc by then, but still had its shortcomings. It was more a car for a driver rather than to be driven in. Hello and welcome to episode 38 of the Collecting Addicts podcast. Once again, you find us spread about all over the globe. Manish Pandey is in London. Chris Cooper is near London. Chris Harris is in Bristol, which isn't that far from London. Edward Lovett is in New York. And Neil Clifford is in Mexico, where he is not going to be watching the Grand Prix this weekend, which I think is a quite brilliant piece of organisation. Um, we're going to kick off this. We're going to with a nerd subject um someone well one of this group chris cooper posed the interesting observation i think on the back of a new lexus that's been launched in europe which is essentially a minivan that's being sold as a replacement for the lexus ls i call them ls 400s because that's what they were when they were launched but the ls lexus appears to sort of be dead in europe and that was one of the first cars perhaps more than the nsx that signalled the arrival of Japanese manufacturers as a real test for the mainstream uh, executive car makers of Europe. So why is it the LS is dead? And is it a shame? Do we care? Chris Cooper. Uh, it does seem to be dead. And we'll put a, a picture up uh, while we're talking. This LM, I mean, it's a train carriage for the road. It's just some chairs being conveyed on something that might be a van. I mean, it's just... In, Is that in what it's my, called? A Lexus LM? Le, yeah, Lexus LM. In 1991, two years after the LS400 arrived, Lexus was outselling Mercedes and BMW in the US. Can you imagine that bus doing that? So, and the NSX, we all know the NSX story the Ayrton Senna story, those loafers, and when we first saw how does Ayrton drive the car when he's just bup, 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 on the throttle the whole time, the NSX video and all those stories and all the people that had the chance to drive with him in NSX at Silverstone that time they came, all this kind of thing. So they clearly could do it. But the question you posed, which actually, you know, Monkey, you posed, which I think is, is a really good one, is why can't they sustain it? Why has why it kind of gone wrong? And if you sort of, we'll come back to the GTR, because you could argue that Mizuno Sun has sort of kept that going, maybe with the significant efforts of our friend Mr. Litchfield over here and the huge following he has for it, kept that going for quite a long time. And I kind of, I've done quite a bit of work with Japanese corporations. I want to be careful what I say in any detail, but they are different. The corporate governance culture, the management culture is quite different. First time I ever presented to boards of Japanese businesses with their UK or European, I was genuinely shocked as to how conservative, deferential, hierarchical, and how amazingly unhappy people were to hear anything other than what they wanted to hear. Um, some of you will have heard of, you can go and look it up, it's quite a good story, the Olympus scandal. The Olympus scandal emerged a few years ago um, when a British CEO, been a life at Olympus, eventually got to be CEO and said, we've been lying about our numbers forever and ever and ever. And the immediate reaction was to get rid of blah, blah. So it kind of shone a light, which is still shining on Japanese corporate culture, corporate governance. But all of that says, because we could go and down that wormhole some other time, it says there's something about loyalty to the corporation and loyalty to the state of the entity, which feels stronger than the craft, stronger than loyalty to the product or to the customer. Occasionally, something breaks through that. And um, Akio Toyoda, who I think is now retired and gone up to be president, um, we've raced it, Monkey and I, you, we, we raced against him. He raced in 
one of those LFAs in the ring in 2009. He's a he's one of us. Is he a lone voice? Don't know. So it does feel, I mean, that LS 400, the 430, when you go through, it's, it's probably only about the mid 2010s that you think, no, nah, that's just another Japanese car. Up until then, they're amazing. So I do think, sadly, whatever they were drinking when they thought about the NSX and the LS 400, they ain't drinking anymore. And you could sort of see why one or two bright sparks have come and gone and the enduring culture of Japanese corporations is humbled it flat again. That's can I up. answer? Can I um, say one thing about that first, uh, Chris? You you're, you're still doing that. Sorry, I'm doing it for Chris. I but you're, I you're do so that. Be, exactly. I'm just looking at these photos here of this Lexus LM, and it does show you how British centric our podcasts and our tastes are because. We've just come back from Hong Kong, and oh. if Lex if Lexus want to compete in Hong Kong, they are going to need a 2024 Lexus LM to compete with the Alphard. And I know Neil was in New York. I think you left yesterday, and I, I arrived last night. Um, you know, there's no uh, traditional Lexi going to work here. You're going to need to compete with massive black trucks or a Mercedes S-Class here. And, you know, the, these tastes around the world are, are so wildly different. And, and we've also talked before about how intelligent and forward thinking these manufacturers are. And Lexus have clearly made a decision that if they want to compete in that space, there's no point trying to compete against an S-Class or something like that. They need to go this direction that that's a call that they probably made 10 years ago whilst they saw in asia the the alphards you know that type of car starting to gain massive appeal and traction and, and you know chris and i saw you know there's tons of those things running around hong kong that's kind of that's the go-to car you don't see yeah. anyone in priuses or s classes that that's the way to travel in hong kong no clifford I think it's a brilliant question, this. You know, it's like when you go and take a year off because you got fired from your job and you go and do an MBA, and you get this question, right? It's brilliant. And I thought quite a bit about it because is it is it the fact that it's just their ultimate extreme push for innovation, complete focus on technology, their massive obsession with engineering beyond any consideration of emotional past i don't think so actually i just think that if you've ever been out for a night out in tokyo everyone's actually 10 years old yeah <laughs> and i think it's a it, i think i think it's an incredible place i adore tokyo Probably is probably my favourite city, but they're all brilliantly bonkers. And if you see the things you can buy in vending machines, everyone's about ten years old. Yeah, and therefore I just think that they forget about the last toy they had, like a Christmas present, and they move on to the next one. So I don't. I, I think it's not about this obsession with engineering without any emotion of worrying about. Oh my God, we must continue the bloodline of the NSX. They just put the NSX in the toy box because it's last year's toy, and they go and get a new one and design it all from scratch. So that's probably what I think. That there's a there, there probably is a lack of emotional connection to the past. Yeah, because it wouldn't happen in Germany, would it? You know, no. you, we all we all refer to the nine eleven as probably the ultimate ability to reinvent something and just make it a little bit better every time. And we all wish they did that with the bloody NSX. You imagine the NSX now that it just slowly got better. Oh, yeah. we'd all want one, wouldn't we? Unfortunately, yeah. they forgot how good they forgot how good the the first one was, and then they designed that shit one with the hybrid thing in it, and no one wanted. Yeah, <laughs> I think um, yeah, I I agree with all of all of what's been said. That 
I, I don't like generalizing and speaking about nations as such, but they as a people are one of the most interesting and fa fascinating paradoxes on, on the planet, because I agree so much of culturally what's thrown at you in Tokyo, which is, it's the biggest um, smack in the face that any city can give you. It's, it's an extraordinary Amazing. piece of energy that just whacks you in the face. Like a sort of one of those, one of those sort of wave things of the so sonic waves that hits you in Star Wars and goes whoom in the cinema. It's one of those. They are 10 years old, but they're also locked into hierarchical societies that, that are fixed. So they have they have respect societies. They behave like 10 year olds, but they they nod and bow and hand out their business card to the person <laughs> that works above them. And they don't question. This is the key. Right. They don't question the tactics of the person above them because their corporations don't allow that. Yep. And the way that manifests itself in their car product for me to take a massive leap forward is that they tend to have periods of just conforming. And then they suddenly do something extraordinary. And, and, their, and their car history proves that. They do, they are mundane, they're mundane, then suddenly an NSX comes out of nowhere. And then they go back to being mundane again because they don't really, I don't know whether they're, they look in the mirror and think, did we do that? That NSX, was that us? I got, oh, that was amazing. Christ, yeah. we, I'm not sure we could do another one of those. The Yaris GR was the last one. Yeah. I can promise you that every other European car maker, if they made a Yaris GR, would now be planning the Yaris GR Mark 2, 3, 4, and 5. It'd be on the board. I bet you Toys is just going, oh, that, was, that was pretty amazing. Who did that? Oh, that was us. Yeah. yeah. And I, and well, they I, did. I, it's funny because they, they did that. They, they did the GR obviously for UK, Europe, Australia, but in the US they didn't do it, did they? They done the Corolla GR, and you can't yeah. get that over here. Yeah, I, they're they're curious, but they, I think they're not. One thing that I do find really interesting, and it does almost make their products more powerful, is that they're not interested in refining icons and, and sort of creating icons in perpetuity. They just like it being there, like the oval piston honda race bike just you know you've done it once leave it there and then yeah. they won't mention it in their material their pr materials for 20 years and suddenly out of nowhere they can go oh we did this a few years ago yeah. so a bit of me loves it because it, it's a bit like it's a bit like meeting someone that you know i'll give an example as a student you meet that person that can do, do that thing with a pint they can neck it in one you know <laughs> it just goes down their gullet and the next time you meet them every time you're in the pub you want to say to them do that thing you do with the pint <laughs> but they choose not to they just know they can do it yeah and I think I quite like that about the about Japanese car makers. It means that we're always slightly pregnant with the thought they might be about to do something spectacular. But it does also mean that it feels like their icons are in some way neglected. Uh, and, and also with the with the last NSX, which actually I, I did enjoy, the one from 10 years ago, it puts immense pressure on a Japanese car company when they do resurrect a name. Because if they don't, if it yeah. doesn't meet the standard required, they're yeah. in the shizzle, aren't they? And it matters really things. CRX fell into that category, didn't it? When they brought that horrible hybrid CRX out. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, disaster. That wasn't that dreadful? Oh, yeah. So, Sorry, Matt, what did you think? No, no. Okay. So <clears throat> I had to do a little reading around this. And uh, I don't know if you remember, a few episodes ago, I talked. we were talking about Mercedes S-Class. And I had said this sort of around the time of the W140, kind of early 90s, um, all the kind of Indian doctors in California that I knew wanted to buy the Lexus LS400. You know, they just could not see the point of spending basically double the money on um, on a car just because it was a Mercedes. And so I read a little bit around it, and you were saying that Toyota, who you've raced against and who is retired now, apparently he pressed the button in the mid '80s on creating the best luxury car Japan would ever do. And it, it's really funny what Neil has just said and what you've sort of attested to. Effectively, you're saying that you've got this hierarchical structure and that it will be obeyed. Now, you know that whatever is going to be in abeyance is only, only going to last a short period of time. But someone at the top who is a bit of a racer, who really does like his car, says, come on, we can beat Germany at its own game here. And they spent, I, I just couldn't believe it, they spent one billion dollars developing that car it was called the f1 and they went for it and and they achieved it and then i do wonder exactly the, the other thing it sort of slightly ties in with if you remember is honda's massive success in formula one yeah they just sort of started yeah. in the the, the a, early 80s they built that awful spirit thing it drove around like a mule with that um 
Honda engine that went on to basically just blow everything out of the toilet, both with Williams and then with McLaren. You wonder whether, you know, that big decision was made, hey, we can't take Honda on in Formula One, but you know what we can do? We can work, make the world's greatest Toyota. And for me, the inductive moment is why they didn't call it the Toyota. You know, to even have the kind of presence of mind, the brilliance to go, we need to create a new brand. Uh, it's going to work. And to take that risk and to pull it off. I think if you do all of those things and then you retrospectively analyze what you've done, you probably end up in exactly the situation that you've talked about. You go, shit, I don't think we can ever do this again. Let's just nod a lot and, and walk away. It's interesting you I say that. I think they're I... like shaking the etch a sketch. They, yeah. they, they design something on an etch a sketch. And then when it's done, they shake it all up and start again. <laughs> yeah. I think I think what what's what's interesting there is the perceived values of of difference between Honda and and Toyota domestically probably between the the eighty early eighties and and now is that Honda was always viewed as an engineering firm a company that did you know it did what it did and it charged yeah. you what it had cost to make it in more Mercedes mold Toyota was always viewed as being more utilitarian it made it made cheaper cars. Its engineering solutions were based more around the commercial side. And I always remember Car Magazine doing a fantastic deconstruction of a Corolla and a Civic in the mid to late 90s. It was just a, it was a four page story, but it really stuck with me. And they just took everything apart. And these are the differences in the cars. I mean, a Honda, a Honda Civic saloon had a fully independent rear suspension system on it. When yeah. we talk, I mean, talk about taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut, just totally unnecessary. Whereas the equivalent Toyota just had a beam yeah. and some rather crappy little springs on top of it. And I and I, that was the, where it worked. And I think that's what was incredible about Lexus, is it it, it was Lexus becoming a Honda to make cars. It was a good point to yeah. manage there. And mm. and no one had seen that before. And that meant it did need a new name, maybe <laughs> because no one would believe that Toyota would go that far. Absolutely. Um, but it does it there was something really Maybe the Lexus LS, even though it sold well in, in America, it never sold that well in Europe um, because we're probably bigger brand snobs. But it, the journalists did love it. My trade couldn't get over how good that car was. Yeah. But but on reflection, if you, I went back and read some of those magazines. The competition wasn't great. The Mercedes then was the W126, would that be yeah. right? It was yep. the 140 that... 140 that... 140 came after. The 140 it. wasn't until 92 or yes. 93. So, so no. you've got a 10-year-old Mercedes-Benz S-Class, which is a bit creaky. Jaguar was all over the place, couldn't work out what it was doing. The BMW 7 Series was a great car and was probably the better than the Merc by then, but still had its shortcomings. It was more a car for a driver rather than to be driven in. Ed, but can you stop doing with that with a pen? That really is Sorry. disturbing. <laughs> um, and um, Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, and so maybe the brilliance of, of Lexus was saying that now is the time to do this because the opposition is at its weakest. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, but it is it is strange how how actually there's a bloke who has got a, a very lovely facility that I was at earlier today in Litchfield's place near Tewkesbury. He is probably doing more to maintain the icon that is the R35 yeah. Skyline than anyone yeah. in Japan, including anyone at Nissan. Totally. Is bizarre. It is, isn't it? It's extraordinary yeah. how that's yeah. how it's turned out. Yeah. Right. Moving on. The, the, the um, brilliant Ma the brilliant brilliant Maz Mazda that's just popped up on Instagram today. Yeah. Um, which we'll probably see. That looks gorgeous. It does. And also confirms there is so, one so icon. So maybe Yeah. You say it, Neil. No, well, maybe and maybe Mazda are going to have their moment. Yeah, again. and also is the, of all the of all the icons that's existed without without any kind of a pause since 1990, it's the MX-5 or is the yeah, MX or we, the we had, that, we had that conversation in the greatest car of the last 30 years, and yeah, I think. What about the Land Cruiser? Cruiser? That, it's interesting, the Land Cruiser, because it's iconic. In different countries, iconic in Australia. No one gives a two figs about it in Europe. Everyone just thinks it's poor Two man's things. Range Rover. You know, you you really need to be an if you if you want to define being a car nerd, it's knowing that an Amazon V8 Land Cruiser is the boss. No one yeah. else knows. No one cares. Yeah. And a WRX or a Mitsubishi Evo. It's all dead, isn't it? They the, those are two companies that completely abandoned those vehicles. No one, mm -hmm. even the car companies themselves, don't care about them. Yeah, Mitsubishi yeah. has gone. The Colt car company based in Sirencester. Yeah, all gone. yeah, all gone. Uh, okay, right. The next question is: 
it, this might be the shortest segment ever on the Collecting Addicts <laughs> podcast. Okay, I'm going to ask this question to Chris Cooper: <laughs> Clear glass or tinted glass? Clear glass. The Edward. End. Edward. Clear glass or tinted glass? Both. But oh god, manish pandy. Clear glass or tinted glass? I'm going to make. I'm going to do a Chris Cooper just quickly. Her Majesty's government have a website on this. I just need to really read this out. The rules for tinted front windscreens and front side windows depends on when the vehicle was first used. There are no rules for tinting the rear windscreen or rear passenger windows. The front windscreen must be at least 70, must let in at least 75% of the light and the front side windows must let in 70% of the light if the vehicle was first used after April the 1st, 1985. If it's before this, it's a straight 70%. So in a nutshell, fucking untint, okay? Clear. Um, no, Clifford. Obviously clear. And obviously silver wheels. So if you have black wheels, please go and spray them silver. <laughs> totally. 100%. I, I, um, I get it you have a clear hate for these things, but um, what about driving in clear glass in a country where the sun is so bloody strong coming in the front winds? And that's the thing. Where are sunglasses? Look sun at that. Glasses. Look okay, at that. Right. Isn't, so, that so isn't that ruinous? Is it's, that mounted? Is that mounted again? Yeah, is it mounted? <laughs> Right. Bad. For the benefit of those, of, for, for the there, benefit of those of you that are not watching this on YouTube, Chris Cooper has again mounted some imagery on on <laughs> phone, and is showing us the difference in profile between an Alpina B four S or Gran Turismo Sport. Gran Turismo, yeah. Gran Turismo. Or was uh, that two different photos he showed us? It's the same oh. car. It's the same car, but Good. tinted or yeah. untinted. Now, so oh, the, the, my re, my oh, that looks quite good, right. that if one. you live if you live in a very very hot country with direct sunlight, then tinted windows, and you've got a dog or kids. I understand. The problem is in this country that we have decided that for whatever reason the police want to see who's behind the wheel, and that means that you can you, you have a disparity between the front side windows <laughs> and the rear side windows. And as any car designer will tell you, I can't design anything. I'm a luddite. They spend a lot of time making sure a car in profile is beautiful. And if the front windows are clear and the back windows are tinted, it totally ruins the symmetry. Totally. The, and the flow of that design is really odd. It's quite jarring when you see it. Yeah. And I, the best solution of all was the Mercedes blue glass that they used to do as an option in the 80s and 90s. You could, you could go for a, 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 tint, a blue tint to the glass, which actually was in some way get some UV reflection in it, but also... You could see through it. It was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And if you can see one of those cars on the road now, they look gorgeous. Yeah. Right, you're, Chris, you're obviously not famous enough. You know, I have to drive from um, SW6 um, to SW6 for work. Uh, it's about um, half a mile. And without tinted glass, I, I get spotted by everyone. I'm the guy off this podcast, and they, you know, they're you drive throwing bright, themselves in the street. You I've got to have my front screen blacked green... out. You drive a bright green Porsche with the hood down, okay? <laughs> Everyone can see you. Um, can I, well, I, can I, I just I say that... about that? Um, we talked about it. Um, at the weekend, the founder of Alpina very sadly died. He did. Um, Boven Seepham. And when the announcement was made, it said, um, very sadly, he died aged 87. Because I'm dyslexic and a bit weird, I read that as... Boven Seaford had died age B7. I hope you'd appreciate it did, that. It, it, it did look that. like it. It did look like it, didn't it? I hope, I, I think he would have appreciated that. He would. He would. Bless him. I met him. I met him at Divon Les Bains, I think it was, at a chateau that he'd, he'd, he and his family had rented to launch a thing called the D5. Yeah. Which is an, which is an, which is an a E39 5 Series. 530D nice. they had super tuned with a D to make the fastest yeah. D's in the world. Its power figures now wouldn't even register. But back then it was comfortably the fastest diesel in the world. And I got and I got I landed as a guest of Volvo to drive something like a C30 or whatever it was. Or maybe it was something older than that. And it would be older than that. And I remember my then editor saying, get in the car and drive straight to the Alpina launch. So but it's across the border, and I shouldn't really be doing that. What's that all about? 
So I, I got in this Volvo, drove to the Alpina launch where I drove the car for five minutes. Burkhard gave me that bottle opener that Edward says he's only got himself, but I've got one. One and one. You get, and, and actually, I've got a, probably got a photo of Burkhard giving it to me, which definitely outranks your gift. Um, and then I drove back again and I got a speeding fine on the way back in the Volvo. And the man from Volvo, when I got the speeding fine, said, where, where were you going? I said, I went to the Alpina launch. He said, but you never reviewed our car. And I said, I wouldn't really think about reviewing it. I just use it as a taxi to go to another car maker's launch. And they didn't invite me back for a while. Oh, there we go. Their loss. Their loss. But, uh, but Alpina, I think in many ways, Burkhard redefined what we expect from a really fast car, a really fast practical car. Because he was, they were the first people to talk about comfort. They were the first people yeah. to say, we don't give a shit whether it doesn't do naughty that fast. They really... They made cars that people that had 20 cars wanted to drive every day. Yeah. Uh, and would leave, they would leave much more exotic machinery in the garage to drive their Alpina. That's quite a trick. And, and I think the company really deserves a pat on the back for that. Yeah, totally. In 100%. some ways, isn't that exactly what Luca did with Ferrari? He just made them drivable and comfortable and you could get in and you could get out. So we have. Yes and no. I think what Burkhardt did. Which is, I mean, he's not, of course, he's not the industry leader that Luca is or was. Sure. But Burkhardt was taking someone else's product. Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. And he was taking yeah. a BMW yeah. and making it even better. Even better. Yeah, he wasn't so taking they, were, a shit they, were, they were already the best cars in the world. And, yeah. and you could argue the arrogance of thinking you could make it better. No one else, I mean, most other Very people are absolute holics of it. Yeah. Sure. Um, right. This is uh, this is one that's um, oh no we're going to do cars this week. So what have we driven this week? I mean I've been all over the place this week, so I've got lots of tasty morsels to talk about. No, Clifford, have you driven a car in Mexico or New York? I rented a car. Did you in New York? A Cadillac Escalade. <laughs> nice. I hope you can hear me because I'm yeah. going in and out a little bit on the mic. Yep. Um, and I decided on Sunday to go upstate New York because upstate New York is the new trendy place. It's much cooler than the Hamptons. It's what yeah. everyone talks about. Everyone dresses like Kurt Cobain. Um, is it the Bruton? Is it the Bruton of New York State now? Uh, yes, it is. It's the, it's the sort of Cotswolds, I suppose. Yeah. It's, the, it's the Cotswolds. We don't it's have a Hamptons in New York. Do we? Well, I don't think we have a Hamptons, do we? Can't really say that West Witterings is the. <laughs> oh, I won't have that. Or maybe, maybe it's maybe it's Cornwall down in yeah, southern probably. Cornwall. Yeah, probably that's um, yeah. Where's well, yeah. that place but, in uh, Norfolk? There's a place in Norfolk, isn't there? It's supposed to be Chelsea on Sea. Yes. Yeah, and um, begins with A. What's yes. A, Albra. Suffolk. Albra. Yeah. Albra. Yes. Albra. Yeah. Suffolk. Yeah. 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 Oh. But that's 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 the media lovies, really. The po the posh people with too much money go to Cornwall, Southern Cornwall. I think, Chris. <laughs> I'm not interested yeah. in that. I want to know what it's like yeah. driving Escalade in New York State. Oh, Escalade, okay. Escalade okay. is so cool. Oh, it's magic. It's so good. I mean, it's probably too big for British roads, but everything worked. The car play, the heated seats, the stereo was brilliant i've got my wife and son in tow super comfortable cruise control laser beam cruise all of that big v8 engine the size of a bus i mean it makes a range rover look tiny <laughs> but we and it, it was in white which was even better so that I, is unusual i put, put a little picture much better than a black one because yeah. then you're not a sort of luxury uber driver and then we did 200 miles all the way north up to Hudson, had a lunch, bombed around the um, mountains up there, which was super good. Went to Tivoli, um, just sort of zoomed around. I was given a lovely little map by a friend who's got a house up there. So we went to all the all the cool places, um, very, very low key, you know, houses that were really restaurants, but with no name out front. So you don't really know where you're going. It's all a bit in with the in club, but actually beautiful. No, no cars on the road. Um, if you lived in Manhattan, you'd have a little shack up there with four garages and a bed, basically, in a bog. It'd be bloody fantastic. Um, Did you get so, as yeah, far? Lovely, lovely. Did you get yes. as far as Cox Sackey? No, but 
But I did discover that, as anyone saw my Instagram story. And I, I found a place called Brewster, which was very nice. Absolutely. But I know I went as far... Poughkeepsie is a place that I'd never seen apart from on the BA map. If you land in JFK, yeah. you see you see a thing called Poughkeepsie. And I went through there, but Hudson was the furthest place. <laughs> um, so lovely, 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 lovely. That was what I did this week, amongst Wonderful. other things, but that's the most interesting thing. Uh, Chris Cooper. So I spent quite a bit of Sunday in a car very similar to a, an Escalade, a 1962 Mini Minor. Uh, which is now my <laughs> mini Madwick. Um, Because next Wednesday, um, there's a little track day at Goodwood. Uh, just for minis, little mini, mini... Just little minis. Yeah. Just for little minis, yeah. Uh, Swiftie are doing it. So I'm taking... We'll put a picture up. Taking my mini Madwick and my mini FIA race car, which I bought from collecting cars uh-huh. in the summer. With about 15 minutes of observation and thought and awareness, I saw it one Friday afternoon, King, I really like look at that, and I ended up buying it. So we're going to track it on the track for the first time. So on Sunday, I spent half the day trying to start the Mini Magic because it really doesn't like starting if it hasn't started for a while. And it needed warming up before Lynn and I went to the pub. We had a lovely pub lunch at a pub called the Preywood Arms, which is next to the Gorhambury Estate, just north of St. Albans. Uh, really lovely. So to warm up the car, because it's a bit lumpy otherwise, I took it out and did skids, which was really good fun. So it was quite dry and obviously very, very small, tiny little tyres, so nobody really notices you're doing skids. It was brilliant. And you just sort of chuck it in a bit too much and the rear starts to go and you wait until you point in the right direction. You don't turn the wheel, just chuck it in and then just squeeze open the throttle and you rock it out the slip road the other side of the roundabout, Ossifer. So it was great. Round, yeah, there's roundabouts on a private road, is there? Are oh, they're all private roads? Yes, sorry, they're I meant to all that, private yeah. roads. All private roads, yeah. yeah. Edward Lovett, I've got a very good idea what you were up to over the last few days. So we're probably going to tell well, the same stories. So I'll let you get in there first. No, yours are probably well. So ours started. I've got just a list of cars here, but it started with a 17-year-old, 469,000 kilometer extended wheelbase phantom which wow. didn't make a single rattle that collected us from hong kong airport and took us into hong kong we then proceeded Edward, that that phantom did four hundred sixty nine thousand miles yes that was one of 17 Isn't that like going had. around hong kong four hundred sixty nine thousand miles. but it's a half hour into the airport and back so it does it's done hundreds of miles a day Wow. Yeah. It's the, pen- yeah. the, penin- the peninsula cars. He's got 16 yeah. of them, hasn't he? 17, 17. 16, yeah. Oh, they ha- there's 11 still running, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that took us into town. We uh, checked into our hotels for about 30 minutes. We're greeted with a cocktail waiting for us in the hotel room, which we proceeded to drink, then went out and got what can only be described as rat arsed uh, rolled out of bed the next morning at, at about 5.30. <laughs> Chris and I definitely were worse for wear. And and I just thought I'd, I'd – I'm not, not going to tell you everything we did, but I just thought I'd list a few cars. Pagani Zonda F, Pagani Zonda 760, LFA, right-hand drive 3-litre RS, 9-8 to eight Cabriolet, 1 of 1, one owner from New Mura, Lister, XL1, McLaren F1, uh, GT1, CLK, GTR. The list goes on. And we were there for 48 hours. The cars, the passion, the intensity was just remarkable um, and so wonderful to see. So, yeah, that, that's what our whirlwind weekend trip to to hong kong looked like it did look it did look yeah. there was uh there's there's a lot of there's a lot of undiscovered uh metal and plastic there uh it's the opposite of dubai really dubai is just a cod piece this is a victorian corduroy dress that comes down to ankle level it's so dignified. No one wants to tell you what they've got, but I suspect that if you if if you if you're a nerd that wants that wants to collate where all the vehicles on the planet are, if you're missing any, I would harbour a guess they're either yeah. in Tokyo or they're in Hong Kong. 
those are the two places that don't shout about what they've yeah. got. Um, it, it, it yeah, it was pretty amazing. So I echo everything Edward said. Hong Kong, amazing car culture. You, you just wouldn't think there would be one, but there really is. Uh, we were we were told one story of of a uh, nineteen I think a nineteen eighty one Aston Volante V eight parked underground in a in a house or in an apartment block up on the peak somewhere that um, that an English guy has sort of been walking past for the last eight years, and he decided eventually he would try and get a private investigator on to see who owned it and they eventually got it was owned by a company and they eventually got the address of the company and he wrote a lovely letter to the um director of the company and eventually got a telephone call back effectively saying don't you ever write me a letter again this 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 car must have been parked there for 20 years and they're paying 400 pounds a month to store it whilst it's just rotting away and they don't want and it's going to stay there forever by the sounds of it um yeah it was, it, I, so it started i started off by dropping off my yellow car for its 61 62,000 mile service um and then we i was driven i went to the airport in the back of a new s class which i think better and better they really are they might be the new mini caps but they're a mighty mini cab for me yeah. Then a phantom. The whole thing felt ridiculous. Bear in mind, I live in a flat. Um, and then I, I've, I've, I drove a Zagato V12 Vantage, a green one out there, which is which Chris and I used to race against. One of those that Mr. Meaden used Dig to and drive. Zag. Um, and and then I got back here uh, yesterday. It was a write off for me, and I went up to get my. Uh, I've got a Golf GTI that one of my offspring drives now and again which needed some work doing to it as they do so i went and collected that from licho's place got back here and met a man from porsche who's just handed over to me the new spider rs which is which is the gt4 oh. RS without a roof nice. and everyone tells me it's quite a good car because it's got less spring rate because the other the, the rs is a bit firm for the road anyhow it's got quite the roof on it so normally when people say, should we give you a walk around the car? I say, ah, don't worry about it. But these bloody things are so complicated with these catches and what have you, because they want a lightweight roof. Anyhow, the, the lovely chap who was super helpful from Porsche showed me how to do it. And then he said, I, no, we'll put it back together again. And we put it back together again. I drove off and straight away it went, you've not put the roof on right. And it's just binging away at me. And I can't work out what I've done wrong. One of the 97 procedures I've done wrong. It's a great car, but it's for clever people. I'm just not I'm sure I'm clever enough for a car like that. I think I'd rather just have, I'd rather, it's going to be a great car to drive, but I need a simpler solution because I'm too much of an idiot. How's uh, the weather this weekend? I don't know. Mixed. Okay. Uh, but I'm one of those people, that if, I've, if I've got one of those for a week, the roof's off, even if it's raining, I'm I'm going to enjoy it with the roof off. Just keep the roof off and then stick it in the garage. Why fast? fast? It's been a, it's been a, yes, I love weeks like this where it's just totally random. And I think the more that you have an interesting car week, the more your synapses are tuned to be interested in what's around you. If you're yeah. doing interesting stuff, I suddenly found myself in a cab at about 3 a.m. in Hong Kong, not knowing where I was. And I had had a few too many to drink. And I tried to get back to the hotel. But by the time we got back near the hotel, they closed all the roads off for a cycle race. Only in Hong Kong do they have a cycle race at two in the morning. There, well, were, to do it. Yeah. there were competitors, right? But we couldn't get near the hotel. And the bloke that was driving us was getting quite irate because I had no cash as well, obviously. And I but, but I found myself deep in conversation about how he found the UX on his ta on his taxi, whether he, he whether he liked a touch screen. I didn't like a touch screen because it got too smudgy. I agree with him. And then we were talking about whether the ride was good over the bumps. I'm I'm quite carry at the moment. I'm I'm enjoying my cars. That's I, quite, I, I think that's quite I mean, I yeah. started noticing maybe because of the Alpina pictures. I've started noticing four series grand coupes on the road. <laughs> They're quite nice. I quite like them. That little yeah. bustle bit at the back, clear glass obs. But they're actually quite, even the, because the i4 is that shape, mm. but even the 420, right? No, they, nice. these grand coupes have always been quite, I mean, the original six grand coupe, I think it's a great looking car. Yeah. Yeah. Manish, what have you been up to? So bizarre that you'd be talking about BMW. So I got onto the BMW car configurator. Well, can't and talk about that. Hit, and almost hit by on a on on a new five series touring because I feel I need to do it. Do it, just good, do it. But I cannot allow you to talk about this. car configurators because otherwise Chris Cooper will have he'll he'll blow an O ring if we do that. No, but so so the big question is: Do I? 
go for the really sensible 520 petrol. I'm not going to get the hybrid because it really doesn't have a boot. Yeah. It really doesn't. It really doesn't. There's a great bit of battery there. So, or do I go 540 with the whole lot, given that it'll be driven 2,000 miles a year? I think, M5 you know, the, I think you know the answer race. here. Go for the one with the smallest oh, engine. Because you will not the benefit from the 540 nice. at all. Yeah. It drives nice. It drives good, the 520. Okay. Yeah. And can I just ask, what do people think of um, Tanzanite blue with with a cognac interior? So the Tanzanite yeah. blue is very dark. Perfect. Yeah. You like that? Proved. Sounds delightful. All right. I, all okay. Bo- I'm going to put some up. All boxes have been ticked. So Manish is going to buy a 520 with a cognac interior. I think we can all say that we'll believe it when we see it. <laughs> well, by the way, how long will it be before I see it? Do you? Does I anyone don't know. I suspect quite anything? a long time. I suspect it'll be six months. Yeah. Really? Well, then, yeah, the lag, the lead time on these things is quite long now. They're built to order pretty much. Unless they offer you something similar that's in the pipeline. Yeah. Right. That. Does that happen? Has it got an air-conditioned glove box? I need to check that. I'm Almost certainly not. It. BMW don't do it. Yeah. They, don't, they tend not to do it. You probably but, don't need the uh, the milk though for the uh, in the I glove box. I think I, I think at the age of seventeen and a half years old and six feet two inches tall, you can have some warm water. <laughs> I um, I watched I watched Meet the Fockers the other night, and that scene where the bloke drinks the breast milk still gets me every time. <laughs> 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 But by the way, did you know that Coxsackie is actually a virus? It's the class of virus for polio and hepatitis A, if I remember correctly. It's an enterovirus. None of none of those are things to be giggled at. They're quite you know, think, that's interesting, but not very funny. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that, <laughs> if, if it was if funny, if you've got... it would be okay. I think, Serious, I think but... the, hep- the hepatitis is the, is the horrible sounding word. Yeah. Right, here we go. Uh, this is an observation that I made, which will mean it's less clever than the observations the others made. Um, at the weekend uh, in the F1, I think we could say that Lewis, um, uh, despite the fact the car got disqualified, had a turn of speed that was more impressive than previously. And he drove pretty well all weekend. Um, and actually, it was probably a, a team decision that that let him down. And I don't believe he's in charge of his own skid blocks. Um, so, so we could probably assume that the reason why his weekend didn't turn out the way it should have done was because of the team. Last year with Ferrari, we saw some remarkable decision-making by the team that I think undermined their drivers, one of which, Charles Leclerc, I'm not sure he's fully recovered from the way that he was undermined by his team. Um, so here's my observation and the question to, to, to my panel here. I think that increasingly, Formula 1 drivers make fewer and fewer mistakes. They're just remarkably competent and gifted athletes. But it seems the teams make more and more mistakes to me at the moment, or, or maybe because the, the the sport is trading in such fine margins, when they make minor boo-boos, they become much more visible and obvious to us, the viewing public. Um, I'll hand over to Manish on this one now. Do we agree with that statement? Yeah, I think that's really fair. And I think what's amplified it are the rule changes. I mean, whenever you have rule changes, you have these massive swings. Some people get things right, some people don't. And then you've got that very early arms race where everyone's trying to catch up with whatever it is Red Bull, as it turns out, has. And um, I think it was funny this weekend because um, on Friday, I think I'm going to throw up now. <laughs> Neil, you do realise if anyone's watching this, it's going to like it's going to be like, it's going to be like someone watch. with epilepsy seeing a flashing light and put the warning up. <laughs> I do apologise, but I'm trying to switch from Wi-Fi to 5G. It's brilliant. It it's brilliant. It's brilliant to watch. So, but I'll, I'll show you what we're seeing now. We're seeing this. Yeah. <laughs> and then random cleaners walking behind you upside down. I oh, know. Sorry. 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 Can we just sorry. now we just need a now we just need a hippo and something else. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Go on, Manish. No. So, um. I thought there was something obviously going on this weekend when Max was in such a foul mood on Friday. And they were saying, uh, I, I can't remember where I read it, probably the race Friday evening, saying that um, Red Bull were having to run their car particularly high because of the bumps. And um, that just meant that the Red Bull for the first time this season had a back wing that looked like you know something you'd find on the front of a truck. And he really hates that because it turns his car, as Chris Harris would say, into an Audi. 
I mean, it just wants to understeer into every single, and we all know he hates that. What was very, very interesting on, on Saturday for me was, you know, it shows you how brilliant a driver he is. I'm, I'm slightly digressing, but, you know, he got around that. And then he said something very, very interesting on Saturday night. He said, um, here's the problem with sprint races. Everybody kind of now knows on Saturday what's going to happen on Sunday, which I thought was very, very profound. But, but getting back to your point, um, so how do Mercedes take this on? And I think they sat down and went, you know what? We've, you know, we're not fighting for a championship. It would be brilliant, Neil. <laughs> what would be happening is... Uh, sorry, everyone. We saw the inside of an umbrella with, with what looked like a single spotlight in it. It looks like it looked like a cat's bum hole. Let's let's be honest. It, it is like rain. A... It's 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 pouring with rain here as well. <laughs> really? I'm, I'm, un, I'm under an umbrella. So <laughs> For everyone who watches the BBC News, I mean, a hurricane has actually hit the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. So, you know, I know Neil is yeah. a little way away from it. So. Just, I, I do wonder, Chris, the, the, the sort of deeper point you're making is when your opposition is so far ahead of you, is it worth flipping a coin now and again, taking a chance? You know, four cars get their ride height measured, you know, four, four go into post-race scrutineering. And, you know, they caught Leclerc, they caught Lewis. But the truth is, you know, what do teams have to lose? So, Perhaps you're right. It is a bunch of mistakes. And I think you're right. Last year with Ferrari, there was a lot of keystone cops going on. But I think the Mercedes, you know, they're smart. They took a little bit of a measured, I also, think. Also, let's face it. The one thing you don't hear on the radio is that the moment that Max has finished the race, he's going to go get protest the ride height on both those cars because he came from the back. It's interesting, isn't it? Normally, he doesn't see the back of cars. Yeah. or care about seeing them. But he saw the back of all of those cars and he'd, he'd have said to his, his, his engineers, they were running fucking low. Have if he would have seen it, it's exactly, exactly right. You know, he has not started a race from anything other than really pole or second in a while. I mean, I know he had that fifth, but exactly that. He's in, you know, where did he start? Sixth, wasn't sixth. it? Yeah, so he started sixth, yeah. But the driver, the driver team dynamic is really interesting because the bit that you don't see that you just get a hint of is that when a driver fires it into the wall, the team is gutted. It yeah. is it is a team effort. And the bloke that's on the wheel, the bloke that's on the wheel gun is just as important at that moment. That's why F1 is a fantastic sport and why so many people learn from Absolutely it. Agree. And, and so and, and it's reciprocal. So I think I think the driver does have a right to, to have a go when the team lets them down. But all too often it's it's done in public and it comes across as petulant and childish and spoiled. And there is a way of doing it. But fundamentally, if you're if you're Lewis and the, and you lose and you're fighting to get tenths of a second back a lap and you lose 10 seconds in a pit stop, you know, many people would, in most other sports, I'm a, a golfer or who, a golfer who hit an 11 on a par three would say, <laughs> honest this and get walking to the clubhouse. They wouldn't even carry on. At half time, if a football team's eight nil down, they give up. F1 drivers <laughs> do kind of have to carry on. Um, so uh, Chris Cooper, what do you think? So um, I, I think you're right. Um, but I think in part that's a perception of, you know, if you go back to the 70s and 80s, then teams made far, in some respects, far greater and more grotesque mistakes, but we just didn't see it or weren't as aware of it. There was an interesting article, interview I saw last, I meant to mention it last week, after the Japanese Grand Prix, when the Mercs were a bit toot, um, Lewis was interviewed and said, I'm going back to the factory after Suzuka, I'm going to go to talk to the engineers to see if they're making those changes I asked for. Like, oh, crikey, Ooh. Lewis is here. We better work harder. Ooh. And then James Allison was interviewed. It's a hilarious interview. He said, um, uh, I basically think, um, he said, drivers sometimes conflate a problem with knowing what the solution is. Where it is a massive help is the driver says, what is a car not giving you? He said, but um, if a driver says, however, they are lacking rear downforce, he said, oh, that's really helpful. I've solved it. I'll just go down to the rear downforce shop and buy me some more rear downforce. That will solve it. Basically saying, stick to what you do, drivers. <laughs> One day, if we have an event and I get very drunk, I'm going to tell more people about an hilarious story I heard. I had a curry about 10 years ago 
with a lot of people you currently see on the pit wall at races discussing a very, very well-known driver who, when he arrived at a new team, looking at the front wing said, I think that front wing needs more curly bits because my old team had quite curly bits. And I'll tell you who all the people were. So I think you're right. I think the teams, it's interesting, Mercedes have now said, oh yeah, uh, our pit stops, they're a bit shit, aren't they? Mm, yeah, probably they are. So it's a, it's diminishing margins, isn't it? You can't say we're going to have a three and a half second pit stop and that's sort of okay. And I do wonder whether it's sort of the, culturally have Mercedes just got, somebody somewhere must have looked at the data to say, I'm sure three seconds on average isn't very good, but why did it take to this Grand Prix? So, so yeah, basically I think you're right. And all of them have made, since in that last stint, um, and the ones got caught, my understanding from talking to a few people in the know was that one of the reasons why Lewis got caught and it, the evidence or suggestion seems to be that George's car didn't or wouldn't have failed because Lewis was running it softer because he wanted to absorb more of the bounces and it was the bouncing that was rubbing the car away. So that gave him the confidence because certainly on the hards in the middle, Lewis was way faster than George. In the medium stint at the end, the last 16 laps, George was 10 seconds faster than Max and three seconds faster than Lewis over that stint. Maybe the medium tires just work better, who knows? But the scrutiny on them now is just enormous. So, yeah, I think the answer to the question is yes. Um, there's a lot more focus on them. And I think if you've got Ferrari in your team name, we've said it before, they need to sort themselves out. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a difficult job. Uh, Edward Lovett, what do you think? Uh, no, no, no Formula One comment from me today. I've been <laughs> off Formula One for the last two weeks. I haven't watched anything, so I, I haven't it. got a clue what's going on, apart from, apart from apparently Qatar was hot. <laughs> there you go. Uh, no Clifford, <laughs> did you watch it? Well, my observation maybe is aren't the cars just easier to drive nowadays than they were in the olden days? That's why people don't make as many mistakes. Excuse me. Bless you. Bless you. I think I think that's only partly true. I think they're I think they have the ability to be more difficult to drive, but the key difference for me is they have an automatic transmission, effectively. Yes. The, the, yes. the, the thing that the thing that determined okay, to rephrase that, the number of times you saw an overtake as a kid in Formula One, you thought, oh, that car's faster than the other one. It's because someone fluffed a gear change. Yes. That's as simple as that. And if you if you don't get it absolutely mm. bang on in a manual car, you're done for. So yeah, that I think I think in some respects that's easier, but that just means that the it pushes it puts the pressure on other areas of your driving, you know. So there's always my view is the best drivers of any generation will always be the best drivers of any generation. They'll overcome they'll overcome problems that lesser drivers can't overcome. Yeah. But also cars are more reliable, aren't they? Like they are when I was in the Fiat when I was in the Fiat garage in 1983, you could you drove out with a Fiat X19. It was probably coming back within a couple of weeks. Yeah. Right? Because it was it was shit. Yeah. And it's um, bizarrely now cars cars don't break down, do they? Yeah. It was uh, bizarrely when they banned testing, which you'd think would be the process that would make them reliable, by banning testing on cost grounds, it forced people to do proper R and D and stress testing and reliability testing. Um the car reliability went whoosh when they banned the process that you thought was going to make them more reliable. And that's why I think we, mm. we now see teams make, making mistakes because in the old days, a, a, a mechanical failure came under the broad heading of a team mistake. It wasn't the driver's fault. Although, yeah. actually, more often than not, the driver would probably buzz the engine by over revving the freaking thing. Yeah. So now I'd rather than seeing mechanical failures, what we're seeing is, um, is, is little mistakes by teams. And also, you could say that... I need to blow my nose, so I sneezed there. Hold on. Yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like two, uh, four. That sounded and a half, like you got it there. Fourteen and a half hour flights in two and a half days. I'm poor idiots. Um, I think you've ended up in a situation where their their mistakes are are amplified by by these fine margins. And one of I reckon if you went to a management consultant such as Chris Cooper and said, "Right, we're making mistakes. What do we do?" The solution might be some sort of collaborative effort between both sides of the fence, the driver. And the, and the engineers. That's what Ferrari did last year, which caused, I think, the biggest shit show I've ever seen. It was almost like it was comedy. We had a driver overruling a pit wall 
about strategy, which, you know, the driver can probably real time give some feedback on how the car's driving, but I don't know what's going on on the rest of the, of the race. No, so no, once no. you opened it up to become a debate, it was, yeah. it was farcical, wasn't it, at times? Yeah. yeah. Did you yeah, hear you Lewis think, um, had quite an interesting exchange um, because effectively they brought him, I think it was five laps later, and I think what Shovelin was trying to tell him was, no, it's just an offset. Because he didn't understand. I mean, you could see he did not understand why he was coming. He thought, oh, I've been undercut. I've absolutely lost this. And they played effectively the Red Bull game from the last Grand Prix. Very, very cleverly preserved those tyres so he could have a good crack at the end. Right, chaps. We're slightly on the clock tonight, so we're going to move straight to our two-car garage, mm -hmm. um, which comes from the huge... I think it's the YouTube comments, wasn't it, guys? Yes. Um, Yes. And it is, it's interesting, this one. I'm going to read it out in its entirety because it contains, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good poser and also it's, um, it, it, the end of it explains some of the language. Two-car garage. You're in, your, you're in your 60, singular. Just divorced with an E and the kids are gone to wherever. <laughs> you thought, 1H, you were going to be okay by being alone, but you had to find a pretty lady to keep you company, you spelt Y-U-O. So you need one car, one spelt O-N-R, car, to impress and seduce the chicks, and one as a daily driver, with some comfy seats, spelt correctly, to protect your cookie crumbling back, all spelt correctly. Thank you very much from Denmark. Thank you for such a wonderful piece of entertainment. P.S. I'm drunk as a skunk. R-N, don't even know what R-N is, not a word. So bear with me. Heart, beer emoji, car emoji, and <laughs> crying emoji, which probably means this is vaguely autobiographical. So let's begin <laughs> with Neil Clifford answering that. We've got four minutes to answer this, all right? So let's get on with it. Neil Clifford, right. let's go. Right. There are only two curl cars girls like. Yep. One is a Mercedes, one is a Mercedes Pagoda. Yep. And one is a 356. <laughs> all other... All, all other cars, gir girls do not care about. And the louder they are and the uglier they are or flashier they are, the more they hate them. So it has to be, I'm going 356, yeah. uh, Cabriolet. Um, and then, oh, comfy, I'm going Mercedes. There's no budget in this, actually. No, but I'm no, going but you're say, divorced, you're 60. Yeah, that's okay. I've got plenty of money. Um, three five six speedster cabriolet right hand drive one of seven in black whatever it is and then i'm going mercedes s 65 coupe cabriolet but it's not a black week. one the, the only one that's you know piston heads is all bloody black ones are you going ones. You, are you going uh, Dezinio? Dezinio, full-on Dezinio, yeah and burmeister Everything. Yes. Comfort the comfort seats. I'm going, I'm going manish spec, navy blue with cognac. Yes. With every single option ticked. Yeah. And just a beautiful, beautiful thing. So big multi vein wheels. Oh yeah, exactly. And if you, if anyone chooses any cars that girls think they're gonna like, and it's not a pagoda or a three five six, you're wrong. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I think I think I might be in the zone of wrongness. Uh, Manish, over to you. Okay, just uh, this is from the novel Thunderball. Hitaki, who's the uh, bomber pilot who basically lands a thing in the water, he's oh. been paid a lot of money, and he's fantasizing about what he wants to buy with his money. And the first thing he wants, this isn't doing a quick Chris Cooper, the car I'm going to choose, but as a Maserati three thousand five hundred GT with a gear body. The novel was written in 60 once. So you can imagine the car. This is what he writes. He would only drive the car really fast when he wanted a girl. They melted in a fast car. Why was that? The sense of surrender to the machine, to the man whose strong sunburned hands were on the wheel. But it was always so. You turned, you turned <clears throat> the car into a wood after 10 minutes at 150, and you would almost have to lift the girl out of the car and lay her down on the moss. That is Bloody what Ian Fleming wrote. How are they, they going to have to rewrite it? these? These are going to get the Royal Dull treatments in these box, aren't they? It's going to have to be... Oh, yeah. And he laid her down on the... Yes, moss. I can't really think about what, not the moss. 
<laughs> or, he anyway. laid down, or he laid down on her moss. <laughs> I don't know. Carry on. What are your two cars, Manish? So, um, I'm going with the Neil vibe here, but I think the car that's going to get you, because the guy's 60, okay? And I think, you know, we're all knocking on that. Well, you aren't, Harris, but you aren't. Love it, actually. Three of us are knocking on that. So, uh, so what you want is a really wonderful lady in her probably mid-40s, perhaps even a little older, who's just, just wonderful, just beautiful. And I think she's going to fall in love with a 1957 Mercedes 300 SL Roadster. And it's going to be a gunmetal car with red leather. And it's going to have that picnic basket in the back. Yep. And that picnic mm -hmm. basket's going to have Christoffel cutlery and Christoffel crockery. And it's going to have some Riedel glasses. And there's going to be one baguette in there, some cream cheese, and a bottle of Laurent Perrier rosé, and a gramophone. That's going to be on the little seat between you. So that is going to be the car. And the other car, for me, my daily driver, because I have loads and loads of money, is going to be a Rolls-Royce Phantom, the one with the two seats in the back that's got the leg extensions, yes. just like the old first-class plane. So your cookie crumbling back, just lean back and do this. That is what they're going to be. You pulled, Pandy. I think those, are, those, are good, <laughs> those are good choices. In fact, we did it the other day. Chris Cooper, over to you. So I think there's a lot of jeopardy in here at lots of levels. And I think Neil's probably right. So this is a public service to see this is how badly you could get it wrong. OK. So I think for the the car for the pretty ladies and the chicks, it would be possible for somebody to say it's a Ford Mustang GT convertible in a bright orange colour. Worse, worse, four cylinder with an automatic gearbox. Somebody in their 60s might think that is the answer. We had to tell you that it isn't. The other car they could get wrong would be a daily driver would be something like a 2016 GLE 63 because they think it's a nice comfy Merc. It's white. It's got rock hard suspension, rock hard seats. You've just got it all wrong. There's so much jeopardy in here. So my two car garage is how not to do it. Go on. Oh, is it? That's, that's it. it. He's oh, done that's it. Okay. He's done the inverted two car three, garage. Three, inverted one. He's done something. He's done. He's done something Ooh. that many Japanese companies do. He's done something a bit edgy that none of the rest of the world fucking understood. <laughs> yeah. Very <Right>. good. <laughs> uh, it's a Edward bit outside the Venn diagram. Edward love it's it. A bit outside. I, I, so I've decided that I'm. 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 I'm a New Yorker. I'm. Um, I'm in the center of the world when it comes to capitalism here. So, uh, and and also driving around these amazing streets where you want to look up at the buildings i need something i can look up in so i convinced my now ex-wife that we should put most of our life savings into um <laughs> the lucid stock when they ipo'd so we 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 walked down to so we thought we'd, we'd order a lucid air so we bought ourselves two hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of lucid air because it's got a nice glass roof and you can look up and um we joined the IPO at, at, uh, and we went down to the uh, the New York Stock Exchange and we, we Did you bought ring it. the bell? Are you important enough to ring the bell? No, we, we didn't ring the bell, but we turned up in our Lucid Air that we'd just taken delivery for for $258,000. Um, and we bought in on the day at $25.24. And uh, I was, she loved me. A few weeks later, she loved me. We were up at $55. Um. She's now divorced me because we're now at four dollars a share. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she she left me at eight dollars, <laughs> and we're we're now at four dollars. <laughs> but I do still have my lucid air, which is good for my cookie crumble back crumbler back, um, and also I can look up at the amazing buildings uh, in in New York. Now, Neil, I've written mm. here. 280 exactly. Exactly. Pagoda. There you go. Because I yeah. do think that's probably the car to take a lady around in New York yeah. with the yeah. roof off on a summer's evening. Indian yeah. summer it is here now. Would nice you go summer. for the automatic or the manual? I, I manual. think I, well, yeah, I think I would go for the manual, although the one for in terms of value, it's the automatic. But yes, I'm not great to picking value, as you could see by my uh, Tesla purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 
Not Emmanuel tenuous, is much sorry. better. Lucid, lucid. I, th- I mean, once again, I, I appreciate all of your input because I think, you know, you just make the quality of my decisions look even higher. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I think this isn't the two-car garage question because there is one car that does this. I There's knew one, you'd do this. There is We're one the outside of the Venn diagram, and we have the only circle coming. We do, out. we do. So, so there's one car, there's one brand, and there's one particular model, I think, that doesn't make old men look too icky as long as they're dressed reasonably discreetly, and it doesn't make doesn't make them like they're trying too hard. It's a quiet display of wealth, but it is also brilliantly comfortable. So this is a one car garage. Okay, I think the current Bentley Continental GT is a quite brilliant car. I think you could impress people in it, but it's comfortable enough to be a daily. I think it doesn't shout too loudly. It's not too footballer. It's just a brilliant car. One of those in that dark blue with a nice Cohiba interior is a one car solution. Of course, the other car is the 911 short wheelbase that you race in the two litre cup. Because once you've worked out that you didn't want another girlfriend and you are actually meant to be single, you can go off with your mates and do some racing without a ball and chain slowing your life down. It's a much better solution, isn't it? <laughs> That's why I yeah, said this yeah, is full Chris, of jeopardy. Every time you this do- This is full of jeopardy. Every time you do the two car garage, it is so Hercule Poirot, isn't it? The way he does this every week. He just I, brings all the little clues together. But quite often, quite often, I do admit that you've made better, but you've, you've answered the question better than me. I all actually, I always admit that. And there's been times when you've answered with the same answers and I had to go at the back. So I don't think, I, I don't think that's a, 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 an observation that you made about all of our two car garages. Absolutely true. Mon ami. Right. Okay. Um, we're going to end it there because we've we're up on our time now. So we'll do some music later. Uh, Al Boley, Al Boley, Midnight, and the Stars and You. There you from go. The shining, blinding lights. You, you from too. the shining on a gramophone in your Mercedes 300 <laughs> SLRs. Man, it's lovely. Go on, Neil Clifford. Have you got one very quickly without explaining it or not? Talk tonight, Oasis. Mm. Brilliant. Good Chris talk. Cooper. Kasabian, Lost Souls Forever. Mine's not. Mine's not even music. It's the fact that I've just watched the first two episodes of The World at War again, uh, which I think is the greatest TV show or TV program ever yeah. made. So you can, it's, it's, it's on UK Gold. You can but you can watch it for free with adverts. Go back and watch it. Best TV ever. We'll just okay. buy all the DVDs. I want. Um, I want to say thank you to my co-host Chris Cooper, Manish Pandey, Edward Lovett, uh, and Neil Clifford, who both two of whom have dialed in uh, in awkward time zones. Uh, we love you very much. Uh, we'll see you next week or speak to you next week. Lots of love from all of us.